Now we're ready to look at the different neurotransmitters that we'll be really using throughout the entire semester to help explain cognition and behavior. And so we'll start here with acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that is involved in stimulating our muscles, so out in the body. And it's also involved in the brain. It's involved in learning. Um, levels seem to be lower in people who have Alzheimer's disease. So it is definitely associated with cognition and thought processes. And then we'll take a look here at a group of neurotransmitters called the monoamines. So these three neurotransmitters, we aren't going to talk too much about epinephrine, but we will talk about serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. They are chemically very similar. Um, so they are all what are called monoamines. And we'll see when we talk about antidepressants that the early antidepressants acted on all of these because they were so chemically similar. Serotonin is involved in mood, sleep and arousal, aggression, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, and alcoholism. Dopamine, we hear about a lot. It uh, contributes to movement control. So it's definitely involved in regulating the uh, activity of the motor cortex. Importantly, it also promotes the reinforcing effects of food, sex, and drugs. Um, and it is involved in schizophrenia as well as Parkinson's disease. The neurotransmitter epinephrine is a hormone released during stress. It functions as a neurotransmitter within the brain to increase arousal and attentiveness to events in the environment. It's also involved in depression. Um, it can be reduced in depression and it can enhance memories for stressful events as well. And then here we can take a look at what are called the amino acid neurotransmitters. Glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. It's involved in like 70% of your brain's pathways. Um, and so it's definitely going to be, you know, opening sodium channels, stimulating brain activity. It's going to be involved in learning and is also implicated in schizophrenia. Another one here um, is GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, but we'll know it as GABA. It is the major inhibitory neurotransmitter. So glutamate's excitatory, GABA's inhibitory. Its re receptors respond to alcohol and benzodiazepines. Um, and so you can see how alcohol and anti-anxiety drugs like benzodiazepines can reduce neural activity. Um, and so we'll, we'll definitely be referring to GABA a lot during the course as well. We are not gonna do anything with glycine in the semester. There are also a different class of neurotransmitters called the neuropeptides. That includes endorf endorphins, substance P, and neuropeptide Y. Endorphins are involved in pain reduction. Substance P is involved in transmitting pain signals. So substance P is the pain signal, but then endorphins can go down and reduce that pain input. And then there's neuropeptide Y, which is involved in eating um, and associated with appetite. And then finally, we'll, we'll see this, um, that there's a gas neurotransmitter called nitric oxide. It's involved in um, creating new neural pathways when we form a memory. So we will definitely be learning about neuro nitric oxide as well. Now, that's a pretty small number of neurotransmitters. What gives our brain added flexibility is that we have a variety of receptor subtypes that create more complexity and more flexibility. So as an example, we'll look at acetylcholine. Acetylcholine has what are called um, nicotinic receptors as well as muscarinic receptors. Um, and so nicotinic should sort of ring a bell, right? Nicotine. So yeah, nicotine binds to the nicotinic receptors um, for acetylcholine, but then there are other ones that are muscarinic receptors that the drug nicotine doesn't really bind to much. So we can see that that gives some variety in, in the different actions that a neurotransmitter can have based on which receptor it's binding to. Neurons can release more than one chemical at a time. So in a given synapse, 
an axon might release both excitatory and inhibitory transmitters, um, uh, you know, at, through different synapses. So it can definitely um, sort of mix and match. Now let's take a look at these steps involved in releasing neurotransmitter. So first off, the neurotransmitter has to be made, right? It has to be created. And so the way it's created is by being synthesized from what are called precursors. Think of precursors as the ingredients. And um, these ingredients get put together with the help of enzymes. They're formed and then they get packaged and stored into these vesicles. That's step two. The vesicles keep them safe because there are degrading enzymes that could destroy them and um, bring them back down into their original ingredients. So the vesicle is super important here in keeping them safe. The um, action potential, remember, will cause the vesicles to fuse with the cell membrane and then release the units of neurotransmitter out into the synapse. The neurotransmitter can bind to the receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. We've already seen that. But take a look what's happening over here. There are receptors on the presynaptic neuron. Yeah, those are called autoreceptors. And the autoreceptors play an important role. They are sort of like the feedback that there's enough neurotransmitter out here. So once there's enough out here and some starts binding to the autoreceptors, that's gonna basically turn off the release of the neurotransmitter. So we can see here in point number five, that when the neurotransmitter binds with autoreceptors, it will inhibit subsequent neurotransmitter release. So it basically shuts off the, the flow of the neurotransmitter. And it's just, again, a, a way of regulating how much is out here and making sure you don't flood the synapse with more than you need to. The neurotransmitter um, that don't bind to autoreceptors or don't bind to receptors, they get deactivated either by reuptake, right, being brought back in here and repackaged into vesicles, or by being broken back, broken down into their original precursors and allowed then in a later step to form into new neurotransmitter. And so what we're going to see is that drugs can influence a variety of these different steps and can you know sort of increase or decrease the activity of a neurotransmitter by by playing around with these steps so here we just have a verbal like sort of written description of some of the things that we've talked about i want to focus on um, some of the effects of drugs here so some drugs mimic the effects of natural transmitters and they might for example stimulate the receptor themselves as if they were a neurotransmitter. So any drug that is like a neurotransmitter or increases the amount of a neurotransmitter is going to be called an agonist. Other, neurotrans other drugs will block the neurotransmitter receptor um, or in some other way decrease the activity of a neurotransmitter. So the drug naloxone, for example, blocks opioid receptors and that means that if a person has taken heroin, the naloxone will block the receptors that heroin would normally bind to. And when it does that, it's essentially limiting the activity of the heroin. And so that's why naloxone is given as an antidote to, for a heroin overdose. It occupies the same receptors as heroin, and so it basically is sort of um, protecting the neurons from the heroin by occupying the receptor but it occupies it but it doesn't stimulate it so it's just sort of occupying it and blocking the um, heroin from doing anything to it so those types of drugs that have the effect of reducing the effect of a, of a neurotransmitter system those are called antagonists so agonists would be the same as adding neurotransmitter antagonists would be the same as getting rid of or blocking a neurotransmitter some drugs can enhance or reduce you know, neurotransmitter effects. Um, so as an example, antidepressants will often block the reuptake of serotonin. So if you've heard of se selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, 
those that just you can kind of break down that word it selectively um, inhibits the reuptake of serotonin so if we think back what's reuptake reuptake is where the neurotransmitters brought back into the terminals right and recite that sort of that that recovery or I think they would have started kind of a recycling of the neurotransmitter so if you inhibit that if you prevent that reuptake from happening you're going to leave the serotonin out there in the synapse longer and so that's going to enhance the effect of the serotonin of the neurotransmitter so that would be an agonist similarly some drugs can prevent neurotransmitter inactivation that's the um, where the enzymes break it back down into the original ingredients the precursors and an example of that is a class of drugs called MAOIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And we'll talk about this definitely more when we look at antidepressants. But basically, if you prevent the reuptake or the inactivation of a neurotransmitter, you allow the neurotransmitter to live, stay longer in the synapse and have more of an effect. So both of these are going to be agonists. There are lots of examples of agonists and antagonists. Um, so we can look at a few that work on acetylcholine. So in South America, the indigenous peoples have traditionally used a substance called curare. It is an acetylcholine receptor blocker and um, they basically make like a poison dart out of it and they're amazingly uh, good at aiming uh, the poison dart and, bl and blowing it out um, and perhaps hitting a target like a monkey in a tree and what it does is it blocks those acetylcholine receptors. So, so okay, what's that gonna do? Acetylcholine stimulates your muscles. If your acetylcholine receptors on your muscles are blocked, your muscles are not gonna get any signals telling them to move. You're basically paralyzed. And so when the monkey gets hit with the, the dart, with curare, it is paralyzed and it'll fall out of the tree. Um, and so that's an example of a receptor blocker. Um, the tetanus toxin, in contrast, will stimulate the release of acetylcholine. So it sends a whole bunch of acetylcholine out into the muscle, causing all the muscles to contract all at once, obviously creating a lot of pain and um, difficulties there. And then Botox, which is used to reduce wrinkling and stuff, what it basically does is it reduces the release of acetylcholine, right? So in the case of where it's injected into your facial mus uh, muscles, it will um, reduce the amount of acetylcholine that's released, which means you're not going to be able to frown with your you know, um, forehead as much or smile as much, or depending on wherever the, the injections are, it's going to prevent some of those muscle signals to get to those muscles. And so go through real quick and identify curare, tetanus, and Botox as either agonists or antagonists. And so if it blocks the receptors, that's an antagonist. It stops the muscles from getting the signals. Tetanus stimulates, right? The acetylcholine release, so more acetylcholine, that would be an agonist and Botox reduces the release of acetylcholine, that would be an antagonist. There are also synapses where one neuron's axon can regulate the activity of another axon. So that's called axo-axonic. So one axon to another. And basically it just sort of um, leads to an adjustment in the amount of the neurotransmitter that's released and it, it usually called either presynaptic inhibition by re reducing the amount of neurotransmitter or presynaptic excitation increasing the amount of neurotransmitter in addition glial cells can be really helpful at the synapse they prevent the neurotransmitter from spreading to other synapses they help with the absorption and recycling of neurotransmitter for the neurons reuse and they release glutamate to help regulate presynaptic transmitter release um, as in the case of presynaptic excitation here.